Hi, everybody. It's uh, a pleasure to uh, notice um, <clears throat> that the number of participants to our seminars, online seminars and lectures is um, picking up uh, in terms of numbers, which uh, hints at the fact that our EU Asia project uh, at the Robert Schumann Center is also <clears throat> uh, picking up interest. Um, we have the good fortune uh, of uh, having a top-notch uh, China uh, specialist uh, from Japan with us today. And before I introduce uh, Professor Chisako Masuo, allow me to <clears throat> uh, let you all know that we are recording the session um, so that it will go online on YouTube. And so <clears throat> with this caveat, uh, be aware that... Uh, um, our uh, uh, seminar will uh, be publicly available, and for this reason, you're more than ha you're more than free to uh, uh, let your uh, 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 cameras uh, switched off uh, when uh, we engage into a Q and A. And if you so wish, also uh, change uh, your uh, uh, credentials. The name that appears on the screen. Um, Chisako Masuo has been uh, following uh, Chinese affairs for 25 years, and uh, she is uh, mm, an associate professor at the Graduate School of Social and Cultural Studies at uh, Kyushu University. And uh, Kyushu University, <clears throat> you should know, is uh, in a region that is closest to the continent. So I guess this has allowed also a uh, um, uh, longer history uh, of uh, uh, studies of uh, uh, East Asian affairs. And uh, Professor Mazuo has also been uh, working uh, at Harvard uh, uh, um, with uh, the late Professor Ezra Vogel, um, the uh, doyen of uh, contemporary Japanese and uh, Chinese uh, uh, studies. Um, <clears throat> and the author uh, of um, an important uh, book on uh, Japan-China relations, in, uh, among others, because uh, Professor Mazur will also mention some of uh, Professor Vogel's other studies during her presentation. And last but not least, she's also a research fellow at the Japan Institute for International Affairs. And so without further ado, uh, I leave the floor to Professor Mazur, and um, <clears throat> we are delighted to have her uh, giving talks online and eventually in December in presence at the European University Institute. And uh, this will be the first, uh, and it will be a historical uh, take on uh, Chinese uh, foreign policy, really, under the Deng years. Uh, but we are delighted to uh, have Professor Masuo also delve into uh, contemporary Chinese affairs, including maritime affairs. and. Uh, we very much look forward to this uh, engagement uh, with, uh, with her uh, uh, high quality work and uh, uh, of learning from, uh, from her. So Professor Mazur, without further ado, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Pakwis. Uh, this is, uh, well, he gave me a very uh, wonderful opportunity to deliver my talks to European University Institute. Well, uh, as he has no, uh, no, uh, mentioned, uh, I have watched China for over, for uh, the last twenty five years since I uh, studied at uh, Peking University for the first time as an undergrad in nineteen ninety six. Um, it was um, I think uh, it was an year uh, for China uh, to tighten up its. Uh, to point it out uh, historical issues over uh, 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 toward uh, Japan. And uh, I did have a very interesting uh, experience uh, staying in China. Uh, everyone, uh, basically everyone I met in China asked me why uh, Japan do not reflect over the uh, about uh, past uh, mistakes uh, 
they made uh, during the invasion uh, against uh, Japan, uh, against China. Uh, and uh, we, dis we had, uh, I had to get involved with the very intense uh, historical debates uh, with the Chinese friends. But uh, looking back now, uh, it, it uh, trained me in a very tough way. And uh, somehow I've been sticking with the uh, analysis of China until now. So um, uh, uh, let me share uh, the PowerPoint uh, now. So uh, can you see it? Yes. Great. So um, today I'm going to talk about, uh, my title is A Quiet Remorse, uh, China's Departure from Revolutionary Diplomacy During the Cold War. I do, uh, I do uh, study uh, Chinese maritime policies and also science policy, but uh, this, uh, today I'm going to talk about my uh, original dissertation. Uh, which uh, focus more on the historical side of the Chinese diplomacy. Um, before entering my talk, uh, I, I can hear many people <laughs> coming in. Uh, I'm very glad to hear that. Um, uh, before going into uh, the details, um, uh, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, well, uh, I had written uh, several books uh, on uh, Chinese foreign, uh, foreign policy, and uh, I have translated two of uh, late uh, Professor Ezra Vogel's books. Uh, one is on Deng Xiaoping and the, trans uh, one, uh, Deng Xiaoping and the Transformation of China. And also uh, another one is uh, China and Japan. He published just a year before he passed away. Uh, last year. So, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, so uh, I had worked with them for many years and uh, it was a very fortunate experience for me because he was a, soci he was a socialist uh, and uh, I, uh, he loved interviews to the Chinese people. Uh, he loved in uh, to interview uh, many Chinese people so I could um, absorb his methodology in some way uh, by, looking at, uh, by looking at him uh, very closely for many years. Uh, but uh, at the same time, as I, uh, uh, as I will uh, mention, uh, I, uh, uh, well, I do carry a lot of uh, literature analysis especially on uh, Chinese bureaucracy and uh, uh, including uh, the bureaucracy of the Communist Party of China. Um, and uh, today's, uh, my today's talk is based on uh, this book of mine. Um, uh, if I, well, this, these are all in Japanese, but um, if I uh, translate uh, the title of this book, I, it's written as Turning Point of Chinese Politics and Diplomacy, Emergence of Independent Foreign Policy in the Reform and Reforms and Opening, uh, which was published by uh, the University of Tokyo Press in 2010. Um, uh, when I was writing, uh, uh, the uh, this book uh, I studied at Peking University for the second time uh, for one another year, and uh, I met many uh, Cold War historians in China. Um, well, today uh, we often talk, we often say that uh, there is no uh, academic liberty in China, and uh, Chinese uh, uh, academic level uh, in uh, social sciences is not that high. But uh, I, uh, even though many people say that, I disagree to it somehow because uh, uh, to some degree, because uh, then I met uh, wonderful uh, Chinese academics and I still admire their level. But in many cases, uh, the political situations do not allow them to publish what they have in their mind. But uh, since I, uh, could uh, 
uh, experience. Uh, uh, well, I, I could, you know, <laughs> I could stay in China for a, a relative uh, for uh, for a certain uh, period of time and could uh, get to know uh, many uh, wonderful uh, uh, Chinese academics. I know uh, that there are many uh, wonderful uh, scholars in China uh, who. Uh, could be very critical to the government. And during the uh, Jiangsu Ming period, I uh, stayed in China for the second time, uh, which was in 2001, from 2001 to 2002. Uh, I, uh, looking back now, uh, it was the peak of uh, Chinese academic freedom, I, could, I can say, uh, because uh, if uh, when I was staying at Peking University, uh, it was very exciting to me um, and for and also for many other foreign students and also uh, many Chinese students, I guess, because uh, many academics were uh, expressing their critical view of the government using uh, especially uh, the um, historical documents. Uh, sometimes from other countries and sometimes collected uh, inside China. So um, I uh, went through a very, uh, the golden period of uh, Chinese academism uh, during that period, which is no longer there anymore. So um, uh, uh, so, uh, well, uh, <laughs> I'll stop here. So uh, I thought, uh, and uh, the table of contents, uh, today I'm going to deliver my talks in uh, this order. First, I will uh, propose uh, some questions and introduction on the Chinese uh, reforms and opening uh, together with, uh, with, its, uh, with the foreign policy uh, taken that uh, initiated that time, and uh, then I will go into the con uh, the real contents of my talk. Uh, I will explain uh, the coordination uh, coordinated relationship between Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping on the external affairs, and then uh, uh, I will. Uh, explain uh, at the third uh, stage, I will explain how uh, Mao Zedong, how Deng Xiaoping uh, initiated reforms and opening by using uh, Mao Zedong's logics. And um, then uh, at the fourth stage, I will uh, discuss how um, uh, the how Chinese leaders and ex experts uh, went through uh, a quiet remorse period on it, their former foreign policies, especially the revolutionary diplomacy uh, that they, uh, when they uh, interfered other uh, communist parties uh, domestic affairs. And then uh, at the end, uh, I will uh, briefly uh, summarize uh, the mechanism of uh, policy change in China that I can uh, uh, claim uh, after my, uh, my this research of mine. Well, uh, I, first I uh, <laughs> kind of expect, expected that many students uh, would uh, attend uh, the seminar, uh, today's seminar. So I uh, was, Kind of uh, trying to uh, collect uh, the uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, Oops, no, not this. Uh, the uh, very simple question. Uh, uh, well, today uh, I guess uh, many uh, researchers are attending uh, this seminar. But uh, may I ask, uh, when you hear the word ch uh, China, uh, what adjectives uh, come uh, come to your mind? Uh, can you write it down in the chat a little bit? I just want to collect uh, very sim uh, your images on China, like rich or uh, nice or <laughs> whatever uh, you have in your mind. Huge, oh, that's right. <laughs> so any other uh, comments? Authoritarian, <laughs> yeah, that's also true. Like soldiers, I see. Power. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you very much. Um, is that all? <laughs> yeah, okay, powerful. Yeah, uh, yeah, that, yeah, polite and friendly, that's also another aspect of Chinese people. All right. Okay, uh, uh, the reason, oh, uh, cent uh, central martial arts. <laughs> okay, uh, I wanted to uh, ask this uh, simple questions because uh, I kind of expected that, that may, some people may uh, uh, refer, uh, may uh, point out that China is rich or uh, China is uh, uh, different from us or <laughs> something like that. Uh, but uh, when we think of a uh, powerful authoritarian uh, China, as it is uh, today, uh, I think uh, uh, the starting point that kind of ch changed China's image in the world uh, was 1978. Uh, well, uh, today, uh, Chinese official history argues that the reforms and openings, uh, which made China very rich, as it is rich and powerful as it is today, has started at the third plenary session of the 17th Central Committee in uh, November to December uh, 1978 under Deng Xiaoping's initiative. So uh, since then, uh, China uh, Chinese economic development uh, had been remarkable. And uh, that also uh, uh, brought China to uh, strengthen its military power and political uh, voice in the world. So, um, uh, but uh, however, um, uh, this reforms and opening has some mysteries in my eyes, uh, uh, because, uh, well, in actually in 78, uh, if you look at the, uh, the document released after this uh, third plenary session, uh, they don't really talk about reforms of China. Uh, what they uh, emphasized uh, was opening, uh, they need to open the country. So uh, the opening was the very, the most important component uh, for uh, the uh, Chinese leaders then. And then uh, after, uh, uh, 79, when China started to uh, uh, make reforms in their economic policies, then uh, they also started to argue that reforms are very important. So uh, gradually, uh, they started to use the word reforms and opening. However, uh, this reform and re re reforms and openings actually started from 78. Uh, but if you think of it, uh, it's kind of strange that China didn't uh, propose its new foreign policy until uh, 82. Uh, in uh, 1982, uh, in September, uh, at the 12th National Congress of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, Hu Yaobang, who was going to be elected as the secret party secretary uh, during the Congress, uh, stated as follows. Independence, independence and self-reliance will always be our standpoint in the past, present, and future. The Chinese people cherish friendship and cooperation with other countries and peoples, but they also cherish the right to independence and autonomy that they have long uh, struggled to acquire. So uh, and, uh, this is regarded as the new uh, Chinese foreign policy during the era of uh, reform, reforms and openings. And uh, during the uh, National Congress, uh, uh, Hu Yaobang also uh, proposed two sets of uh, foreign principles, uh, external principles. Uh, the first set was uh, the five principles of peaceful coexistence, uh, which is very famous uh, in China and uh, maybe in the world. But this, uh, these principles are meant for state to state relations. And uh, why I <laughs> emphasize this is that China was preparing other 
sets of uh, foreign principles for uh, the party to party relations, uh, four principles for the relations among uh, proletarian parties. And uh, this, uh, these uh, principles um, basically discussed uh, non-interference to other parties' uh, in internal affairs and uh, something like that. So uh, if you look at it now, you never, you don't really uh, recognize why it was that important. However, if you think of, uh, it was very natural for the Chinese Communist Party to interfere other parties' affairs to carry on uh, the international movement, uh, international uh, communist movement uh, during the Cold War. Uh, you, uh, you notice uh, why it was so important. It was uh, when, uh, it was when uh, China actually uh, sent farewell to the revolutionary diplomacy it pursued during the Mao Zedong period, I could say. So uh, I wanted to ask some questions on uh, Deng Xiaoping's reforms and opening uh, with regards to the foreign policy. So first question is, why was Deng, who was ousted by Mao Zedong in 1976, able to initiate reforms and opening in, the, in 1978 when uh, Mao's prestige was still so high. Uh, like, uh, just like uh, Xi Jinping today, uh, Mao Zedong's personal cult was at height during the Cultural Revolution. And uh, people could not go against it. People are so used to follow it because that was the only way for survival. Uh, for many of them uh, during the Cultural Revolution. So uh, even though uh, people had very difficult feelings toward uh, the Supreme Leader, uh, they had to be obedient during those days. But in fact, what Deng did, uh, carry, what he carried uh, during the reforms and opening was going against Mao Zedong, right? Because uh, he put more importance on the economic affairs. Uh, and uh, started market economy, uh, which uh, Mao never, uh, which would, uh, which Mao would never allow him to do if he was alive. And the next question was why and how, uh, why, how, and when uh, did China shift from the revolutionary diplomacy pursued during uh, Mao Zedong period? Uh, did China admit its own mistakes? Um, well, um, well you, we've seen that uh, China never admit mistakes uh, regularly, uh, even during the COVID-19, right? And uh, they uh, put so much uh, value to protect their face. So uh, we never, China never uh, announced how they uh, shifted uh, its uh, foreign policy. Uh, during that period, and uh, many information was hidden uh, until today, had been hidden into, until today. And uh, what was the relationship between uh, economic and foreign policies in China at the beginning of reforms and opening uh, during the Cold War? Uh, this is another question I would like to uh, answer uh, during my presentation. So uh, there are some premises uh, uh, to think of uh, traditional logics of the com Chinese Communist Party, uh, because uh, well, these are like features to think of uh, when we uh, grasp uh, Chinese foreign policy during the Mao Zedong period. Uh, first, uh, when uh, Mao was alive, uh, uh, China's eternal goal was a global social revolution. So, uh, well, and they are the communists, and uh, those people uh, are the ones who lead the pe uh, regular people to uh, bring them to the next historical stage uh, after capitalism. Uh, Marx, Marx was very critical on capitalism, and uh, he wanted to uh, make uh, the world more equal and uh, and maybe more friendly to the general people. Um, and uh, and uh, with this external goal, uh, 
China's uh, the Chinese Communist Party's, well, I could say, uh, standard operating procedure was like this. Well, they are so accustomed to make analysis on the global situations, no matter uh, what issues. Uh, and they have, uh, during uh, Mao Zedong period, uh, they always have to think of uh, the possibilities of uh, the world war, uh, world war, uh, the next world war, because uh, Lenin uh, pointed out that uh, with the war, uh, there will be the world revolution uh, to, uh, and it will be a very big chance for the communists to bring uh, the people to the socialist stage of the mankind. So uh, when on all basically all kinds of issues, uh, they have to make uh, the analysis on the global situations first, and then uh, they could establish uh, domestic and external policies. And of course, domestically, uh, China uh, was uh, making uh, China was based on the planned economy. And uh, there are different levels of external relations uh, because they're, they are the communists. Um, first, uh, on the party, party to party level, uh, they believed uh, that they have to carry, uh, uh, aiming at the, you know, uh, the achievement of socialist revolution, uh, they have to uh, unite with the workers and the communist, uh, communists in the world. And uh, they have to uh, sacrifice themselves in the international communist movement. They were very serious in those days. And uh, then uh, below uh, this party to party relations, uh, they uh, regarded that there is a regular state to state diplomacy. Um, uh, and. Uh, in many cases, in, in, uh, actually, uh, those two um, uh, relations, uh, two sets of relations, sometimes uh, had contradictions to each other. For example, in uh, 1956, um, uh, there was a um, Hungarian uh, political um, movement for democratization. And uh, we know that Soviets uh, invaded Hungary, <laughs> well, sent their army uh, to Hungary to stop the riots, right? Uh, so from the perspective of state to state relations, uh, it's a huge intervention to the domestic affairs of that country. Um, however, uh, Soviets regarded it's necessary to carry on the international communist movement because they have to go, uh, they, they, their aim is to achieve the revolution. And actually, uh, uh, the, uh, based on the analysis of the Cold War uh, history, uh, we now know it was Chinese who uh, encouraged uh, the Soviets to send uh, the military to Hungary uh, at that time. Uh, so uh, there is a very severe contradiction. And uh, in Burma, um, uh, for, uh, for China, uh, the Burman, uh, Burman case is another, uh, shows another uh, kind of contradiction. I know, you know, uh, we, uh, uh, China and Burma uh, proposed five uh, principles of peaceful, peaceful coexistence in uh, 1954. Uh, so they, their state-to-state uh, -state relationship was very favorable. However, uh, during the 50s and 60, uh, 60s, in order to support uh, Burman uh, communists, uh, China also often sent uh, secretive <laughs> presents, uh, like weapons, uh, to uh, the Burman communists uh, and put them in the diplomatic uh, parcels. Uh, secretly, because you know, then a Burman government would not, you know, check it. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, of course, in Burma, uh, the government and those communists were fighting each other. So, uh, from today's eyes, it's a severe uh, intervention to other countries' domestic affairs. So, uh, uh, of my research. 
Um, well, uh, as I have mentioned, uh, I uh, received a lot of impact from uh, Chinese and uh, other, for, uh, other countries, uh, Cold War historians in, in early 2000. And um, uh, to con uh, carry uh, today's uh, research, I conducted uh, many interviews to former Chinese officials and also um, many Chinese business, uh, Japanese businessmen who were involved uh, and who were able to observe uh, Chinese um, uh, behaviors, domestic beha uh, uh, economic behaviors uh, during those days. Uh, because uh, at that time, um, uh, Sino-Japanese relations what was at, uh, at peak. Uh, and also uh, I, con uh, I, I collected a lot of literatures, of course. Um, first, uh, I used a lot of uh, Chinese domestic official materials edited by the party. And also I collected uh, many uh, inner documents on the international communist movement in Chinese universities and uh, secondhand bookshops uh, in early 2000s, uh, which is no longer available, I guess, in China. And I also combined uh, that, uh, the information uh, with the foreign materials uh, I could uh, collect uh, from uh, many libraries uh, in the world, including uh, Harvard. So uh, from here, uh, I would like to go into uh, the details a little bit. Um, I try not to get too boy boring. Uh, uh, and uh, please uh, uh, raise your hand uh, if you have any questions. Um, okay, so, uh, so, Oh, well, uh, this uh, the picture is uh, Professor Vogel's uh, the cover picture of the Chinese edition of Deng Xiaoping and the Transformation of China, written by uh, Professor Vogel, and uh, this became a bestseller, one of the bestsellers in China, and uh, as he uh, depicts uh, Deng Xiaoping, uh, his image is uh, he uh, Prof Professor Vogel presented. Uh, was that uh, Tan Xiaoping was an open-minded uh, pragmatist uh, who uh, had very strong leadership in China. Um, well, I don't oppose to him, <laughs> uh, especially on uh, Tan Xiaoping's stubbornness. However, um, uh, in, uh, in, uh, Oh, sorry. Um, and also, it's not only uh, Professor Vogel, but uh, many uh, scholars in both in China and other countries uh, depict uh, Deng Xiaoping as an uh, open-minded leader uh, who pursued realistic development policies uh, in uh, after 1980s. However, uh, on external relations, we have to uh, take it in mind that Deng Xiaoping was a close aide to Mao Zedong, who preferred a very progressive and anti-Soviet policies in early 1960s. Uh, China was involved with the ideological uh, debates with the Soviets since the end of uh, 1950s. And during that time, Deng Xiaoping was the secretary, general secretary of the party under Deng Xiaoping, uh, 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 under Mao Zedong. So uh, he was the one uh, who initiated the ide ideological uh, debate with the Soviets under uh, Mao Zedong's direction. And uh, Mao's, uh, it is famous that Mao's uh, foreign policy had often been uh, different from the ones uh, from the ones uh, pursued by many leaders, many other Chinese leaders, including uh, Zhou Enlai. Uh, those people uh, pursued more um, uh, soft uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, slow uh, uh, progress for the socialist revolution. But Mao was very hasty, and he also went against the Soviets uh, very much. Um, uh, so um, um, Deng Xiaoping was actually following Mao Zedong in terms of foreign policy. 
However, he was ousted in 1966 uh, due to the economic recovery policy he proceeded together with uh, President Liu Shaoqi. Uh, and it was uh, the beginning of uh, cultural revolution. So he, uh, Deng Xiaoping disappeared from uh, many people. Uh, uh, my sister, my uh, daughter came back, but I will ignore. Um, Okay, so uh, so he, um, uh, Deng Xiaoping disappeared from other people uh, for uh, six or seven years. Uh, am I right? Uh, but then uh, Mao Zedong recalled him uh, to strengthen uh, its anti-Soviet diplomatic formation in 1973. Um, we uh, we know that. Uh, Sino-American rapprochement started in 1971. And uh, after that, uh, gradually, uh, Mao Zedong uh, brought uh, Deng Xiaoping back to Beijing. And uh, he made Deng Xiaoping to deliver his uh, three world policy theory at the UN Special Assembly in 1974 that aimed to strengthen uh, the global anti-Soviet -So United Front uh, internally called uh, as one line uh, strategy within China. So, uh, and after the trial period to lead the Chinese foreign policy uh, under uh, Mao Zedong's directions, uh, Deng Xiaoping was entrusted to take care of compre comprehensive domestic and military affairs in uh, early seven, 1975. Uh, then uh, John Lai, Premier John Lai was uh, weakening uh, due to the cancer and uh, Mao Zedong didn't want him to have you know, good treatment. So John Lai was dying and Mao needed somebody else to take care of um, uh, Chinese affairs. So uh, what, under Deng Xiaoping, uh, under Mao Zedong, uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, had uh, carried re, so-called reorganization in uh, 1975 in China. So uh, uh, during that period, uh, Chinese experts and leaders propo proposed for modernization, uh, aiming to rehabilitate rehabilitate and develop Chinese economy. Uh, after uh, many years of cultural revolution, uh, people began to uh, get very tired of political struggles and uh, many uh, general people wanted to have uh, uh, economic stability. So uh, Mao also had to think of those uh, people's wish uh, to gain support from the people. And uh, uh, in, in such situations, um, Deng worked hard to consolidate relations with the Western world, Pakistan, Iran, Yugoslavia, in accordance with Mao's one-line uh, strategy. So uh, this was the most important job he had to take under Mao Zedong. However, in 75, uh, uh, he uh, also hoped to improve Chinese economy by uh, achieving the introduction of Western technology, uh, spending uh, 4.3 billion US dollars. So this plan was called a 4-3 plan uh, in China. Um, well, I'm not, I'm going to skip the details of Chinese foreign policy, Chinese politics, because it's, uh, uh, it'll make you very tired for sure. Uh, but then uh, he was, uh, Deng Xiaoping was criticized by Mao Zedong again in late 75, when he stated science is the main uh, production force, without uh, actually reaffirming uh, the cultural revolution led by Mao Zedong. So there was a, a very uh, severe disagreement with, uh, between those, especially in terms of the foreign policy, uh, uh, domestic policy. But Mao still made Deng Xiaoping to take care of uh, foreign affairs before he finally decided to abandon him uh, after the Tiananmen incident in April uh, 1976. So we can see that somehow Mao Zedong trusted Deng Xiaoping in terms of uh, foreign policy that uh, Deng Xiaoping carried.
And this is very important we, when we think of uh, the beginning of uh, the initiation of our reforms and opening. So uh, I will go into the next step with Mao, uh, conquer Mao, uh, 1978. So uh, Deng Xiaoping was ousted <laughs> again in uh, 76, but he gradually came back uh, to the political scenes. Um, in China, after uh, Mao Zedong's death in uh, April, September uh, 76, uh, Hua Kofang became the supreme leader after, uh, after him. And uh, his, he and his aides allowed Deng Xiaoping to return uh, to the politics, hoping that he would take care of the external affairs in summer uh, 1977. Um, uh, Deng, Deng Xiaoping first accepted, uh, first denied to take care of the external affairs because he said it was too uh, exhausting. Uh, but uh, he managed to accept the responsibilities in science and education. So uh, it was then uh, Chinese universities re, uh, restarted the entrance examination and uh, Deng Xiaoping started to make many interviews to uh, the scientists uh, coming from uh, Western countries. Uh, they may, he mainly uh, interviewed many uh, Chinese scientists who won a uh, Nobel Prize uh, in other countries. Uh, but then uh, he could gain uh, you know, good uh, insights from um, on the situations of science and technology. Um, and after Hua Kofang government affirmed a 10 year program for national economic development to rehabilitate a 4 3 plan in March 78. Of course, this 4 3 plan uh, was the one uh, Deng Xiaoping was pursuing during 75. Um, Deng, Xiaoping became, uh, Deng Xiaoping began to take care of the external affairs again. And um, we can see that there are uh, Chinese government started to send many um, delegations uh, to oversee uh, the situations on the foreign economies uh, during the spring and early summer of uh, 78. Um, and, uh, and those uh, delegations, uh, the news that those delegations brought, uh, came, uh, brought back to China, uh, seemed to have encouraged Deng Xiaoping to take more aggressive economic policy. Uh, on May uh, 30th, uh, he stated like this, the international situation is now in our favor. Uh, the capitalist countries of the West are very anxious for us to become stronger for their interests. Uh, and then on the next month, he ordered uh, the responsible leaders, uh, economic leaders, uh, to expand the technology introduction from the West to the size of 50 billion US dollars. So it's a huge jump uh, from uh, 4.3 billion. Uh, and uh, so this year, uh, it was very uh, important for uh, Deng Xiaoping to uh, hold up the hold up Mao Zedong's one line policy, uh, which is meant to to strengthen the United Front with the Western powers and Yugoslavia or Iran or Pakistan, um, because uh, his logic to initiate the reforms and opening was like this. Uh, Soviet Union and its small ally Vietnam had become a global concern uh, because of their hegemonic expansion toward the South. So uh, he uh, strengthened, uh, he stressed that those, uh, the, the Soviets are very dangerous. And you know, usually uh, if there is a danger, uh, ex uh, very severe external danger, you don't go for economic development. But his idea was very di uh, different. Um, Mao, he stated, he claimed that Mao Zedong's one line strategy had been so successful so that many Western countries were willing to support China's growth for their own interests. Uh, they to uh, deter uh, the threat from the Soviets, uh, the, they, uh, the Western powers are hoping China to grow more. Uh, that was his logic. 
So uh, that means uh, a precious opportunity for the economic development for, Hach, for China had arrived despite the growing threat of the Soviet hegemonism. Uh, this was the logic he uh, stressed within the country. And also, he also uh, put so much importance on the situations that the Asian dragons were achieving uh, development uh, by, uh, by using the uh, uh, Western investments. So, uh, and uh, in later part of 70, 78, Deng Xiaoping won the CCP's leadership using Mao Zedong's one-line strategy. Uh, well, uh, I'm not going to uh, read the details, but uh, we can see that he actually put so much effort to uh, make a good environment for uh, the Chinese uh, external, um, uh, ex uh, for the chi uh, environment for the Chinese, uh, Chinese diplomacy. Uh, so that uh, many uh, other, country, uh, other countries, including uh, Europeans, Americans, and Japanese would uh, cooperate more for China. He wanted to uh, show um, uh, the people in the world that China is a, a trustful uh, friend who can go against the Soviets and the Vietnamese. So he spent so much time in uh, the external affairs uh, during the key periods for the Chinese uh, political situations. And, but somehow he managed to win uh, the CCP leadership by uh, making a new alignment of the external, affair, external environment for China. So uh, we can see that the logical foundation for the initiation of reforms and opening was Mao's one-line uh, one strategy. However, uh, from here, after uh, the Sino-Vietnamese War in uh, February uh, 79, uh, a quiet remorse or reflection over uh, the past uh, Chinese external behaviors would uh, started in China. So uh, uh, how did it happen? Um, actually, uh, Chinese leaders, uh, not Deng Xiaoping himself, but some other leaders and experienced uh, high uh, cadres uh, started to uh, uh, show uh, their uh, disappointments over uh, the existing uh, Chinese foreign policy. Because at the end, uh, the Sino-Vietnamese Sino War was the only uh, war case uh, between the uh, uh, fought by the socialist countries. So, you know, people always, uh, Chinese people also always regarded that socialism is a peaceful, uh, uh, Socialist, uh, socialism was very peaceful, but uh, the socialist countries fought each other, uh, uh, unlike the theory they could predict. So, uh, so that was a huge disappointment, but, uh, and also, uh, but uh, there were many other smaller disappointments. Uh, the United States passed the Taiwan Relations Act that uh, legalized uh, arms sales to Taiwan in uh, April 79. And uh, uh, China, Ch communist, uh, Chinese Communist Party also suspended uh, the aid to the communist parties in the Southeast Asia in summer the same year, because uh, uh, after the Indochina Indo situation changed, China needed to support uh, Pol Pot regime in uh, Cambodia, uh, who was uh, which was already occupied the Vietnamese, so uh, they uh, ordered Pol Pot to continue the guerrilla warfare in Cambodia. But to support them, uh, China had to negotiate with the Thailand, uh, so that the Thai can allow uh, China to uh, uh, carry uh, the. Uh, uh, weapons 
to uh, Pol Pot in Cambodia, you know, other side of uh, Cambodian border was uh, on with the v Vietnam. So China had to go through uh, Thailand in order to support the Pol Pot regime. But uh, for to do that, uh, they had to per persuade the Thai government that they would not uh, support the Thai communists uh, anymore. So uh, uh, the support for Pol Pot regime in Cambodia uh, actually changed China's uh, uh, policy toward its brothers uh, in foreign countries. And uh, uh, China also saw success of Iranian revolution in February, despite China had very uh, good relationship with the king who was kicked out from the country. And uh, uh, China also received criticism from uh, some smaller African countries on the rigidity, uh, rigidity of uh, Chinese one-line strategy uh, uh, during uh, uh, Vice, Pre uh, Vice Premier Li Xianyan's visit to Africa in January. Uh, well, those uh, th those people uh, uh, criticized that China was only supporting uh, the groups uh, distant from the Soviets. So, to, for a one line policy, that was very natural. But uh, they uh, criticized Chinese foreign policy, not realistic, uh, not considerate on the local situations. And um, uh, official uh, uh, remorse uh, process began to take in June uh, 76, uh, after, uh, the, uh, uh, after the fifth conference of uh, foreign uh, ambassadors. And it was uh, the International Liaison Department uh, led by uh, Li Yima, uh, the vice, uh, uh, vice, uh, vice uh, department head of the uh, liaison party, and he to undertook the work to summarize China's past experiences in the international communist movement. And by October, they came to conclusion that the international communist movement had been demolished already after the Sino-Vietnamese war. And the Chinese foreign policy should be based on the national interests rather than the class interests. So it also brought uh, the percep perceptional shift uh, for the Chinese uh, leaders. And uh, uh, this uh, this course was very long, and uh, it's, uh, China spent almost like three years uh, for the entire course. So uh, by seventy nine, uh, China uh, regarded that the revolutionary diplomacy should not be the way. But uh, its vigilance uh, against the Soviet Union still continued. Uh, it still regarded uh, communist, uh, the Soviets to be the to be a huge security threat. Um, but in the light of increasingly complex economic relations, uh, China became more and China gradually became more understanding of other countries' attitudes toward the Soviet Union. Uh, European case was very important because uh, China first. Uh, uh, requested European companies who do business with, the, with Chinese to stop uh, the trade relationship with the Soviets. But they didn't want to listen because for Europeans, uh, business is, is business and politics is politics. Uh, and gradually China had to get accustomed to that idea because it also wanted to have more complex economic relations. And uh, during the discussion over the resolution on some historical questions of the party uh, since the founding of the country, uh, the so-called historical resolution, uh, the, this was actually the second one, and now China is discussing third one. But uh, during the course of uh, the second resolution and discussion, uh, China, uh, there were many uh, different voices, and uh, there were uh, many uh, former diplomats and also leaders uh, showed their uh, uh, 
idea that uh, they uh, should not uh, the uh, the Soviets are may not be the only threat to their uh, foreign policy because uh, uh, they can also uh, sometimes Soviets of course uh, also you know give very favorable uh, treatment to China and they uh, gradually remembered that uh, Soviets did support uh, China's economic development during the fifties and. Uh, uh, so uh, they affirmed uh, the role of Soviet Union. And uh, at the same time, uh, at, uh, at the le uh, Chinese leaders gradually acknowledged the invalidity of one line strategy uh, pursued by Mao Zedong. And uh, there comes uh, the former presentation of uh, the independent foreign policy in uh, 1982. Um, well, the trigger, uh, for the formal presentation was Sino-American disputes over the U.S. arms sales to Taiwan. Uh, at that time, the American side requested uh, China uh, to uh, put more importance on the strategic relationship uh, between uh, the United States and China uh, and uh, allow Americans to uh, continue uh, the arms sales. Uh, to Taiwan, uh, they uh, explained that the Soviet threats is more important. Uh, so China should make some uh, 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 China should consider uh, it should not uh, put that much importance for on the Taiwan issues. Uh, so uh, during the negotiations with the U.S., China clearly recognized that its foreign policy of exaggerating the Soviet threat had become a burden for China. And uh, in Tashkent in March 82, uh, Soviet uh, General Secretary of Rezinev proposed negotiations for improved relations with China. And uh, with the new situations and uh, Chinese leaders decided for full transi transition to a flexible and peaceful foreign policy that seeks to improve relations uh, with all countries by summer. So since then, uh, China's relationship with, uh, for example, South Korea uh, started to improve uh, all of a sudden. So uh, this was the process for uh, Chinese, uh, I can say the most important uh, uh, foreign policy shift. Um, and uh, I would like to summarize at the end, sorry, uh, I'm uh, running out uh, of time, uh, but um, maybe I can say that uh, the most important driver of the gradual foreign shift uh, taken uh, at the early stage of reforms and for, uh, opening was the opposition of uh, to existing policies within the party. Um, and uh, the leaders and experts' uh, reflection over the negative side of uh, Chinese diplomacy was, however, uh, never exposed to the ordinary, ordinary Chinese or foreigners. So until today, well, on the surface, China still uh, shows itself that it has been continuing the same foreign policy, but it's not really this, it's not really true. Uh, China experienced very important change on its foreign policy in early 80s. Um, uh, however, the fact that the Chinese leaders and bureaucrats came to hear uh, many different opinions uh, from many countries, especially smaller powers during the reforms and opening, uh, early stage of reforms and opening promoted uh, China's gradual shift in its foreign policy in the long run. So I think uh, when China uh, changes or adjusts its foreign policy, uh, the uh, trigger often comes from smaller countries because uh, when they talk with the big powers like the United States or Soviet Union, uh, they put so much importance on their face, but they tend to be um, more open-minded uh, for, for the advice from the smaller powers. Uh, Deng Xiaoping finally uh, decided to abandon the support for uh, the uh, foreign uh, communist parties uh, based on uh, his, uh, Lee Kuan Yew's advice 
uh, Lee Kuan Yew was the leader of Singapore, right? Uh, so, uh, and uh, Lee Kuan Yew's uh, sincere advice, uh, he uh, delivered to Deng Xiaoping in, uh, I think uh, that was in uh, November 78, uh, gradually uh, changed Deng Xiaoping's approach to foreign countries. And uh, China also observed absorbed uh, many uh, ideas from smaller powers uh, on a very flat, um, on a very, uh, listen to those uh, small, uh, the voices from smaller countries on an equal basis more easily uh, because they don't have to think of the face in that case. So, um, and uh, after the China's political policy shift, uh, actually it brought a long peace uh, to Asia during the Cold War. And the world global Cold War was still continuing in uh, the 80s, but China's shift for, uh, China's huge shift uh, for, uh, to uh, uh, make more efforts in economic uh, development uh, changed uh, the situations in Asia uh, very dramatically. Uh, and uh, short uh, at the end, uh, I would like to point out uh, some implications for future uh, based on the studies, uh, my previous studies uh, presented today. Uh, well, today Xi Jinping uh, follows a very unique uh, foreign policy, such as Belt and Road Initiatives or <laughs> realization of community of the common destiny of the mankind. Uh, but that could get reviewed secretly after uh, his uh, his age, his his period. And uh, to bring more constructive policies from China in future, I think uh, it is very important to keep contacts with young and young Chinese leaders and scholars to make them exposed to the ideas of other countries. Uh, so that you know, China would see uh, there are more possibilities for their foreign policies, and they don't have they, they don't need to necessarily stick with the uh, former uh, leaders' uh, old policy. So uh, that was the end of my uh, presentation. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. Well, no, thank you, um, <clears throat> Chisako, for a um, comprehensive uh, overview of. Uh, a key turning point in uh, China's in, in external relations. Uh, I uh, myself have a few questions, but uh, since we're short on time, <clears throat> we have half an hour for discussion. I would open the floor for uh, uh, comments, uh, uh, questions. I'm sure that uh, Chisako is happy to receive also criticism. And so whatever kind of uh, intervention you have in mind just um, switch on your camera um, and uh, feel free to um, uh, to intervene while we wait for <clears throat> for uh, some of our distinguished uh, audience members to uh, po possibly participate uh, i have a, a, a straightforward question um, which is symptomatic of my uh, my ignorance when you um, when you talk about a, a, a one line strategy, um, this is already hinting at um, um, less revolutionary colors than uh, expected uh, in terms of China's conduct of foreign affairs. And so, in a sense, would you also say that China was uh, already giving a presidents to its own national interests and pursuing a degree of uh, realpolitik, you could say, precisely because it was trying to square the circle between the three worlds theory and really what is uh, a foreign policy aimed at the Soviet Union. And the second question <clears throat> is related to the first, um, but it goes in a different direction. If China was indeed pursuing its own national interest uh, uh, against the Soviet Union, uh, my feeling is that um, it, it could have been more flexible at times. Uh, uh, for instance, in its negotiations with Japan, my understanding is that uh, there was a degree still of um, 
ideology playing out uh, in China's relationship with Japan. For instance, with regard to uh, the Senkaku Diaoyu Islands. Um, if China was concentrated on the Soviet Union, did Japan have more uh, leeway, for instance, uh, in uh, uh, cementing control and administration over the Senkaku Diaoyu Islands? Would Japan have had uh, more strategic space to uh, take advantage of what was essentially a Chinese weakness? because of the very fact that China was insisting on an anti-hegemony clause uh, and on really on a foreign policy aimed at the Soviet Union. Um, so <clears throat> you see, which is which? Was China obsessed with the Soviet Union or was China really trying uh, as well to pursue its national interest without uh, uh, falling prey of too much focus on the Soviet Union? And so in a sense, if uh, the latter is the answer, China was already pursuing an independent foreign policy, even when it was trying to contain the Soviet Union. You see what I'm trying to get at. Uh, but it was uh, already kind of like focusing on its uh, on its national interests, <clears throat> precisely because it it was able to uh, normalize relations with Japan and then uh, uh, sign a treaty of peace and friendship while while pushing the envelope also on islands that were administered by Japan. And China was successful to, 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 uh, to have fishermen boats uh, around the islands ahead of a treaty of peace and friendship. And also it was able to play its, its weak hand well, I would say, but this is just my impression. And I'm sorry for... Uh, <clears throat> Putting too much flair, too, 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 too many, too, for asking too many questions, really. And uh, while uh, Chisako answers my question, please feel free from audience members. Please feel free to to chip in and raise your hand, and I'll um, and then I'll uh, I'll point at you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for uh, two wonderful questions. Um, yes, uh, what you mentioned is right. Uh, I think uh, Mao Zedong was struggling very much to uh, uh, to present uh, his rev communist logics, uh, uh, after, especially after uh, he decided to uh, improve its, uh, China's relationship with the United States, uh, because uh, the United States should be the largest enemy and now uh, China doesn't did not regard it as uh, the global threat anymore uh, the biggest threat was the Soviets uh, that was uh, Mao Zedong's uh, perception uh, after uh, 69 when um, uh, they had border clash uh, which was triggered actually by the by Mao Zedong's decision um, so, uh, uh, but still he wanted to bridge uh, the revolutionary idea to his realistic foreign policy. And he had to struggle with it. Uh, that was why he tried to create a new theory, uh, the three world theory, even though it didn't look uh, very uh, revolutionary. Uh, he also received a lot of criticism from Albania uh, who was uh, the best ally <laughs> with China during those days. So um, uh, we can see that the gradual shift had been changing and this, uh, the new change be, uh, became even uh, bigger towards the end of 70s. That was when uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, had to decide that China really need to uh, transform its foreign policy. So uh, we can see the continued change uh, since the end of uh, six, uh, 60s uh, in uh, Chinese foreign policy. And uh, thank you very much for uh, pointing out uh, this uh, very interesting question on the Sino-Japanese relations. Uh, I didn't go into the details of uh, the Sino-Japanese uh, uh, treaty uh, for uh, peace for uh, uh, peaceful uh, uh, for peace and uh, friendship uh, signed in uh, 1978. Uh, yeah, um, if I think um, 
uh, yeah, but this is, a, yeah, I think on this, uh, Julio proposed a very interesting question because in the same year, um, the United States also uh, had uh, achieved a diplomatic uh, normalization. Uh, well, uh, it, uh, well uh, in the same year, uh, the United States and China also carried negotiations uh, for the diplomatic uh, normalization of diplomatic relations. And uh, the United States was always uh, persuading China that the Soviets are the largest uh, threat to the world, uh, which uh, the United States and China have to um, go against in a cooperative way. However, uh, Japan's uh, attitude was very uh, different. Um, yeah, uh, I think it was logically it was possible for Japan to exploit uh, China's weakness uh, to stick with the, <laughs> the so Soviet threat. And um, uh, China, Japan could persuade uh, China uh, to take a more favorable position to Japan. However, Japan didn't actually do it during the negotiations. Um, uh, well, uh, the negotiation took more than uh, four years. And during the course, uh, uh, it was uh, publicized that uh, the two countries were debating over inclusion of uh, anti-hegemonic uh, clause in the treaty. And because uh, China wanted Japan to acknowledge the treaty and Japan didn't want to get involved in the Soviet uh, uh, China uh, ideological disputes. So, uh, and uh, Soviet, because uh, Soviets criticized the Japanese governments uh, to respond favorably, uh, favor favorably uh, to uh, China's request, uh, then, uh, China, Japan, Japanese government had to think of its relationship with the Soviets. Uh, we have no, not yet uh, concluded the peace treaty yet, uh, which Japan always wanted to do. So, um, uh, in uh, between Japan and China, it was China who requested uh, uh, Japan uh, uh, to approve uh, the anti-hegemonic uh, clause. Uh, so probably uh, China was more, uh, we can say China was more uh, 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 implying the diplomatic art. <laughs> and um, Jap uh, Japan didn't really uh, use the weakness, exploit the weakness of Chinese um, uh, uh, diplomacy then. Um, in terms of um, uh, fishermen's uh, that the Senkaku incident, um, uh, I, I would like to add some more information to it. Um, uh, Julio has mentioned that China dispatched uh, the fishermen, uh, fishing boats to uh, Senkaku Islands in uh, sep April uh, 78, actually. Um, uh, there were many fishing boats, like 150. Uh, so uh, Jap Japanese government was really surprised. And then uh, it didn't want to respond to uh, China's request to uh, go for uh, the next step of the negotiations for some time. But uh, then um, uh, it seems like uh, the, fish, uh, the fishing boats were not dispatched by Deng Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping didn't know it. And uh, uh, after Deng Xiaoping took the initi diplomatic initiatives, uh, Chinese government started to send messages to uh, the Japanese government that they would no longer uh, carry such activities around the Senkaku Islands. So uh, when uh, uh, Foreign Minister Ohira visited China to conclude uh, the treaty, um, Deng Xiaoping again uh, uh, mentioned that uh, the same thing, uh, China would no longer uh, challenge uh, Japan's claim in such a way. So that was uh, from, from Japanese point of view, that was the foundation 
of um, for uh, the Senkaku Tiao issues. Uh, and Japan never really um, admitted China uh, to control that area or uh, even a uh, claim for that islands uh, during the negotiation. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, <clears throat> our Max Weber fellow, Frieza Stevens, who would like to ask uh, a question. And uh, if there's nobody else, I'll leave uh, the floor to Frieza. Frieza. Uh, thank you, Julio. Um, and thank you, Professor, for a wonderful, uh, wonderful talk. I have um, a question on neo-authoritarianism. Um, in my research, I found a, uh, an article by Wang Huning in, uh, in a journal article in, in, uh, in the 1990s, where he uh, China uh, moving into a direction what um, um, Organsky calls the um, um, stage of power maturity uh, when inter when counter forces come into play, uh, which uh, in the late 2000s was the Obama pivot, and there was a um, a lack of uh, ideology. Um, so my question is, um, till what time was the Singapore model that Wang Huning uh, advocated uh, still in the cards? Was that still in the cards during the who and when era? And my second question um, pertains to, um, uh, you know, you, you, you elaborated, uh, argued quite convincingly how Deng Xiaoping used Mao's texts to basically argue for the opposite. Uh, but he could not have done so um, without extending his power throughout the party system. So my question would be, who did he maneuver into which positions of power? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I didn't uh, get ex uh, I didn't get the first question exactly. Uh, would you uh, explain it a little bit more? Sorry about that. Um, so um, when China uh, was growing stronger um, in the 90s, Wang Huning argued before he was an academic at Fudan. He argued in, a, in an academic journal article that one of the options for China would be the Singapore model. He called it neo-authoritarianism. So my question is, when China in, indeed grew stronger in the, in the 2000s, uh, there were countervailing forces uh, coming up, which he predicted. Uh, the US wanted to remain the hegemon, and also domestically, with uh, China becoming more wealthy, people started demanding more, and there was an ideological vacuum uh, because nobody believed in com communism anymore. So my question is, uh, till what time was the new authoritarian Singapore model still in the cards? Because now obviously uh, it's not in the cards anymore uh, after uh, two terms of, of Xi Jinping. Um, that would be my question. Okay, um, thank you very much for uh, two uh, interesting questions. Um, yeah, Wang Huning is a very important, uh, interesting figure, I think. Uh, he, uh, uh, when I was writing my graduate thesis for the undergrad, um, I have cited him. And at uh, mm -hmm. that time, I, well, I didn't know that he uh, was going to uh, establish his career at the, cent uh, the party central then, but in early 80s, he was very open-minded. And uh, he, uh, later he became a very important ideologue uh, in China. However, uh, at the early stage, he was very open-minded and liberal, and uh, he uh, also had a visiting fellowship at Keio University in China. He, had, he was a very good friend of uh, Kokubun Ryose, who was, uh, was the president of National Defense Academy of Japan. Um, uh, when, um, uh, 
uh, I think not only Wang Huning, but also uh, many um, Chinese uh, scholars and uh, in intellectuals were uh, had been always concerned with the uh, uh, with the way of rising China, um, and uh, uh, I think a neo authoritarianism authoritarianism uh, proposed by Wang Huning is not the only uh, uh, possibility uh, for China. Um, uh, how should I say this? Um, hmm, well, this is a very difficult question for me, um, but how should I say? Hmm, I think uh, China is trying to follow the model of Singapore, that's for sure. However, the size is very different. And uh, and they are always concerned about the obstacles uh, that might have rise, uh, that might rise uh, in the course of China's rise uh, as the largest power in the world. Uh, but at the same time, if China wants to uh, go back to uh, the uh, uh, the number one power in the world, and that's uh, the you know Chinese dream, Xi Jinping always depict. Um, Wang Huning, um, I don't know. Maybe he's uh, losing some of his uh, influence recently, and I think uh, nowadays uh, Xi Jinping himself is probably the most important ideologue in China. Um, I think uh, uh, he, well, uh, of course, uh, the dream of socialist revolution or communism is uh, losing the influence in China. But uh, Xi Jinping's uh, achievement was to change it uh, to Chinese dream and uh, try to uh, achieve a, a huge authority, a new type of authoritarian regime using the science and technological power, uh, which had been uh, uh, developed after uh, the reforms and openings. So uh, Wang Huning's idea on neo-authoritarianism is now uh, probably combined with Xi Jinping's belief in uh, science and technology. And that's how uh, China has been de uh, developed into uh, a huge um, uh, power to, to uh, carry the uh, surveillance and monitoring of its people. So, uh, but Xi Jinping is now very confident about the new model. Uh, so uh, probably it's a, a you know developed version of the older idea, uh, but uh, somehow he wants to create a new a historical model, a uh, new Chinese model in that way. Um, and the next question, uh, what was it? Uh, Deng Xiaoping. Uh, uh, what's the next question? Sorry, I missed to take the note. Um, um, so the next question, uh, thank you for that first answer. That's uh, very interesting how you tie it to Xi Jinping and, and the third third revolution. Uh, thank you. Uh, so th the second question was, um, how did Deng Xiaoping consolidate his power? So it is my understanding that if you want to have influence at the highest level, you need to consolidate through... Uh, uh, party positions. So who did he maneuver into which positions to uh, be that influential? Yeah, that, that was it. So uh, yeah, uh, I think our Chinese leaders are expected uh, to carry two things. Uh, or, uh, or, uh, uh, he has to be very good at in organizing uh, people's movement. And, also in, and for that purpose, he has to propose, he had to be very good at proposing uh, the 
uh, good theory to the people. So uh, on the theory basis, uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, mentioned that it was a very important, precious opportunity for China to move ahead uh, to develop its economy. Uh, but at the same time, uh, politically, uh, domestically, uh, he maneuvered uh, many people. First, he maneuvered uh, some uh, uh, the theorists, actually, like Hu Yaobang, uh, who used to serve uh, Mao Zedong as his secretary, because you know, uh, Deng Xiaoping wanted to use Mao Zedong's theory to gain regain the power. So he grabbed uh, Mao's former secretary. And, uh, and uh, he also maneuvered people like Hu Yaobang, uh and uh and he, i think uh, he also maneuvered Hua Kufang, uh who had less career uh in the uh chinese communist party and uh, tried to persuade him uh that what they are doing was right uh so they had to be very more uh, bold to expand <laughs> the economic uh ambitions or well, actually it was criticized later on after 79 but you know the uh, everybody blamed Hua Kofeng instead of Deng Xiaoping <laughs> unfortunately uh, it was a political uh, phenomenon actually we could see so uh, and uh, Deng Xiaoping was well he moved many other people too but what he uh, often did was to uh, go the localities visit uh, the different areas in China other than Beijing. Uh, in uh, 1978, in September, after he visited uh, North Korea, he uh, continued his, uh, vis uh, his journey to uh, the northeastern part of China and persuaded local cadres that they have to be very brave. So uh, his words actually changed uh, the local malls for the economic um, uh, economic developments. And that news actually was gradually delivered to Beijing and other parts of the world, especially among the uh, specialists on economy. So uh, it was like uh, uh, when Deng Xiaoping uh, made the Southern journey in 1992, so he, he also tried to maneuver the hearts of the local cadres as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It looks like uh, Xi Jinping is also <clears throat> in the process of uh, organizing people, whether by appointing new provincial leaders or purging uh, uh, yeah, top shots. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would love to take uh, advantage of your patience uh, for a very brief uh, uh, question, a, a big one, um, however, uh, because we are running out of time. <clears throat> and be as telegraphic as you wish, uh, um, Chisako. We haven't mentioned, of course, the other key turning point, which you hint at at the, at the very end of your uh, of your. Um, of your presentation. And it seems that you uh, ascribe to uh, the school of thought that Xi Jinping was really in charge um, of um, an overhaul of Chinese foreign policy or a, uh, a change. And what do you make then of uh, uh, what was brewing ahead of Xi Jinping under the latter Hu Jintao uh, uh, era? So for instance, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative some claim it was an evolution of uh, uh, China's go global uh, foreign policy and China's assertiveness under Xi Jinping, uh, the strive for uh, achievements uh, were already evident uh, <clears throat> following the global financial crisis. This is a big question. And it's in a sense, uh, you know, it has echoes of your former, of your uh, earlier points about uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, playing uh, Mao Zedong's uh, drum and kind of, kind of like being an evolutionary leader at the beginning. What do you think? Um, I think I was, uh, in some way, I have a good respect on Xi Jinping. Mm -hmm. I, see. I think uh, he's a big thinker. 
And uh, he's very good at combining uh, many officers' idea and propose big picture, uh, which hasn't uh, ha which haven't been done by uh, uh, Jiang Zemin and Hu Yaobang. You know, uh, I think uh, Xi Jinping knows the importance of drawing the dream for the, the people. So uh, he tries to draw a very big picture. Dream, uh, dream, uh, many dreams, China dream uh, for the people uh, and try to organize, uh, mobilize uh, the, the subordinates for that purpose. So, um, uh, of course, uh, we can see that Belt and Roads in a built and road initiatives, uh, many, uh, many efforts have been uh, taken uh, has been made uh, during the Hu Jintao area. And uh, we can also see that uh, many continuing policies from the uh, Hu Jintao area. However, uh, I think uh, Xi Jinping uh, was very uncomfortable to uh, see many uh, negative developments uh, in, uh, during the Hu Jintao period. Uh, for example, um, China's environment was worsening and the rich and poor um, difference was widening and uh, China wasn't really doing great on the maritime issues. So uh, he uh, summarized all the uh, developments and problems at the same time and tried to propose China, uh, China dream and make made people believe in the dream. So he's a very good uh, politician, I can say, even though we foreigners tend, may, uh, tend do not agree with them. And uh, there are many problems of the Chinese affairs, uh, Chinese behaviors in our eyes. Uh, but I think uh, Xi Jinping is trying to become a good leader, trying to serve as a very good leader and uh, probably our uh, ideal leader uh, for the Chinese nation uh, uh, based on his own understanding of the country. <laughs> did I answer your question? Yes, yes, you did. And, uh, and I think uh, to, to add on it, um, that it's a worldwide trend, that there is a return of charismatic leadership, uh, not just in autocratic countries, but also in, um, in um, <clears throat> In liberal democracies, I'm thinking of Abe Shinzo's Japan, uh, Germany's uh, Angela Merkel, were less charismatic but cl clearly very impactful, um, and um, and of course uh, uh, populist leadership in the UK and the US, for instance. And so, yeah, absolutely. I think it's it's also part of uh, the zeitgeist of the trend of the times. Um, uh, but we have to uh, factor in uh, great men, quote unquote, and uh, who knows, great women, of course. Uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure. We've learned uh, so much and um, we can't wait for uh, you to delve in uh, China's current affairs, which is also my forte. And as you can, <laughs> uh, all, uh, <laughs> and, and as you can imagine, that is also where the EUI has the Robert Schuman Center, especially, which is <clears throat> uh, research intensive but policy also oriented uh, uh, center within uh, the European University Institute, which is this is also where we have been looking at. And we are privileged to have this EU Asia project, which I co lead with Ken Endo, and I can't tire to promote it, uh, follow our activities and our um, uh, events and research papers that we publish. And we very much look forward to, to uh, reconnecting with you next month. Um, and uh, um, Chisako will uh, will uh, uh, be presenting. And uh, uh, inf what, what, what would be the talk uh, next month? Do you remember the topic? Because I remember that there is a something on the state oceanic administration, but that's in December, right? Well, oh, that's in November, actually. November. Oh, Fantastic. Yeah. So oh. I will talk on uh, the shift of Chinese maritime policy. <laughs> I will focus more on the current affairs. Uh, yeah. 
the next time. And um, uh, that is, uh, I can guarantee you, Chisako's uh, forte. Uh, I was her discussant at uh, an ISA panel, and uh, uh, I, I remember learning a lot both at King's College London when she came, came to give a talk and also at the ISA. So I very much look forward to, to learning again. And, um, and uh, that's, uh, that's it for us. Uh, that's it. That's all, folks, as, um, as they used to say uh, during the <coughs> Warner Brothers cartoons. And I guess I can just end uh, the meeting for everybody. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Our pleasure. Bye-bye.